morning, everyone. It's good to see you here today. Let's stand together and take our hymnals. Let's turn over to number two in the hymnal. Everyone stand as we sing, Come Thou Almighty King, on the first verse. Psalm 19, and we'll read a few verses from this psalm today. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 7, down through the end of the chapter, 7 to 14, actually. Or, no, it's Psalm, it's 19, 7 to 5, yes, it is 7 to 14, thank you. Psalm 19, verse 7, ready? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving your word so that we could have the scriptures today and hold in our hands the Bible. What a great blessing that is. And Father, thank you that you convict us with your spirit of our thoughts, our words. And Father, I pray that these would be acceptable in thy sight. And Father, help us to be careful about presuming upon God. And Father, the psalmist asks that he would be delivered from the great transgression, that he would not be presumptuous in singing, sinning against God. And we can, we can presume some things, Father. We can, we can imagine that everything's fine and we're and we're okay, and we don't need to be as diligent as we ought to be. Just because we are inclined to compare ourselves with with others, and compared to others, perhaps. We can look pretty good, but Father, compared to thy holiness, we are severely lacking. And I pray that we would not presume upon you, and Father, we would be very uh, alert and keen. And the Bible teaches us that because we have much, much is expected of us. 
and the word of Christ taught that himself in the Gospel of Luke. And I pray that we would be aware of the opportunities that we have and be thankful for them. And Father, may we praise you and honor the Lord with our response, with our attitude. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good to see you today. And so glad you can be here for the adult Bible class here at Bible Baptist Church during this Sunday school hour. There is a sign-up sheet up that's on the back table for anybody who's going to be at camp this coming Friday for camp close-up. And, and some will be coming out and having some fellowship time and staying overnight and so on. If you, whatever you intend to do, if you're planning to be out there, would you please put your name on that list back there? Also, there are a couple of greeting cards back there, a birthday card for Karen Wyatt that we would encourage the ladies of the church to sign, as well as a get well card for Joanna Lacey that hasn't been sent yet, that is still back there. And please uh, keep in mind the day, and, and you probably couldn't help but notice it's 9-11, and, and continue to pray for those uh, survivors who are still struggling. A lot of people 21 years later are still very angry and bitter about what's happened, and, and certainly uh, it was a violation of, of our sovereignty as a nation, and and there's still many enemies out there that would seek to try to destroy our nation and our freedoms. But pray for the survivors and pray that God would accomplish a great work in their lives. And I know a lot of people are having prayer services today and they're praying for the people who died on 9-11. You know, it's, it's too late for that. It, it, when, when we leave this life, it's too late. And there's no point in any of that, but we can pray that God would still accomplish his work in those that are living and so, and so be mindful of all of that and remember the day. And most people, you know, I can still remember the day that President John F. Kennedy was shot and where you were. And they say you always remember where you were when tragic things like that happened, when you first got word of them. And a lot of people here would remember uh, September 11th of 2001 and where you were when the Twin Towers uh, were attacked. and in New York City and and uh, all that that entailed but but uh, and it was certainly a, a landmark in our nation's history but do, do pray for those who can still be affected positively for righteousness sake by by those events uh, today is Andrew Doss is last Sunday with us and he's headed out for Fargo and then Bismarck and then the Middle East overseas somewhere he'll be and he's not supposed to tell and if you ask him he tells you you will have to kill you <laughs> so <laughs> so don't ask but pray for those especially who are directly impacted by his by his absenteeism and be, has being uh, deployed and of course we'll miss him as well and and do keep all these people in prayer all right, we have anniversaries and birthdays this week. We've got a number of them. Today, Melody Camp's having a birthday. Happy birthday to you, Melody. And Lindsay Norberg tomorrow. Happy birthday, Lindsay. And Carrie Turks later in the week. Thursday, I think it is. And also Karen White on Thursday. So happy birthday to these, all these ladies. Anybody else having a birthday this week? A physical birthday or a spiritual one? Brother Belcourt. And that's obviously a spiritual birthday. <laughs> 40 years since you came to know the Lord. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. Amen. That's a milestone. What's that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So good. So good that, you, that you're here with us and still faithfully serving the Lord after all those years. Amen. That's the way it should be. We should just be drawing ever closer to the Lord and every year should mark a closer fellowship and relationship with him as we serve our Savior. Anybody else with a birthday, physical or spiritual birthday this week? All right, we know of one wedding anniversary, Clay and Glenda Atkinson on the 11th, which is today as well. It, I, I'm looking for Clay or Glenda. Is either one of them here right now? They're in Alaska. Okay, celebrating their anniversary. Do you know how many years they've been married, Anna? 41 years, wow, that's great. Congratulations to them in their absence and I'm glad that they were able to get away for a little while to make a special trip for their anniversary. 41 years, congratulations to the Atkinsons. Anybody else with the wedding anniversary? We'd like to recognize yours if you're having one this coming week. 
All right, well, remember these announcements and those greeting cards and Brother Andrew Doss's departure. And let's sing another song and we'll get to our Bible study right away this morning. Amen. Let's all stand together once again. Turn over to number 203. We would see Jesus, number 203. today and if you're our guest at Bible Baptist Church we welcome you good to have you with us this is our adult Bible class and Sunday school hour and the, it'll be followed by the 11 o'clock preaching service and then six o'clock tonight our regular Sunday evening service Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. when we hold all of our regular services we're continuing a study on the day of the Lord and we're just now getting the next couple of weeks we're getting to the close of it this is lesson number 12 and we're going to talk about in in Revelation chapter 21 the city and the lamb and if you received a church bulletin this morning when you came in, it should that, that lesson sheet should be inserted inside. And if not, if you'd like to have a copy, if you didn't get a copy of that lesson sheet, you'd like to have a copy, would you just lift your hand and the ushers will bring you one real quickly right behind you there, Steve. Anybody else what, that needs the lesson sheet today? Okay, let's thank you, ushers. We appreciate your helping us in that. And would you open your Bible to Revelation chapter 21, and we'll read the text verses for the lesson this morning. We talked about the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new, the new creation, the recreation last Sunday morning in this Bible class, and we're continuing in that text this morning. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 says... And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, and on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them were uh, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, 
and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth a four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs and the length and breadth and height of the of it are equal and he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of man that is of the angel and the building of the wall of it was of jasper and the city was pure gold like unto clear crystal and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, the eleventh the jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, every several gate was of one pearl in the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass and I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it and the city had no need of the sun neither of the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the Lamb is the light thereof and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day for there shall be no night there and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life and we'll consider each of these uh, particular elements today as we study the city and the Lamb in the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us and give us understanding, and so many of these things are beyond us because we, we've never seen such things before, and the glory of it is amazing. Father, we, we just commit it to you, and we thank you for the great and precious promises that you have given to your people and those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who've been saved by your grace will see this glory personally one day and father we just believe your word help us to to apply it and receive it and rejoice in it in jesus name i pray amen when i was reading this portion of scripture i was reminded of ezekiel and we'll look at this in just a moment but note verse note verse 11 in this passage having the glory of god in her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and the likeness back up to ezekiel chapter one with me real quick uh the the wording it's it was like this it was like that and i think that that john would probably be the first to admit i couldn't describe it exactly because it was like something i had never ever seen before and we see this same kind of language except more so in ezekiel chapter one where, where the prophet Ezekiel was seeing this heavenly vision of the glory of God. And in verse 13 and following, the Bible says, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of of a flash of lightning now as I beheld the living creatures behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces the appearance of the wheels in their work was like was like unto the color of a burl and they four had one likeness and their appearance in their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel and when they went they went upon their four sides and they turned not when they went skip down to verse 22 and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the was as the color of a terrible crystal stretched forth ab over their heads above under the firmament were their wings straight and one toward the other everyone had two which covered on this side and everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies when they went i heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the almighty the voice of of speech as the noise of an host when they stood they let down their wings and there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it and I saw as the color of amber, as the appearing of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins, even upward from the appearance of his loins, even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and had brightness round about as the appearance of the bow 
and later on in the verse, so was, so, the, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And, and there are so many of these in, indefinite types of, types of terms that are found in this passage of Scripture. And I think that as the likeness of the appearance of is, is rather extreme in that area. It was kind of like this. It was as this. And it, it kind of looked like this as the appearance. And it was sort of like this as the appearance of the likeness of this and that and the other. Because Ezekiel was seeing things like he'd never seen before. And so, he, and so he, all he could do was say, it kind of reminds me of this. It looks like that. I don't know for sure what it is. But it reminds me of this. And, and John used a little bit of that same kind of language because he was seeing things that he had never seen before. And so we get the idea that, that he was saying, it, it, it's kind of like this. It sort of reminds me of that. But it's not. It's different. And, and I'm, I, I think about 1 Corinthians 2.9, although the context is slightly different. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.9, I hath not seen nor, ear, seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And he's talking about, I think the context is about the here and now, the blessings that God has in the, in the you know, immediate future for his people. They haven't even imagined, they haven't even thought of. But it's also true of the things that are in heaven. We just don't know what it's about. We've never seen such things before. And so we would, we would be in the same situation trying to describe it if we were placed in that position. And let's go ahead and examine the verses of this text in Revelation 21. And we're going to back up a little bit from the text of verse 9 because it mentions something in verse 9 and 10 that I want us to consider. There came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And some people are, read verse 9 and say, oh, oh, oh boy, here it comes. We're going to find out who and what the bride of Christ is. And then he says, he, takes, he took me up to a mountain, and I saw a city. Jesus is not going to, to claim as his bride a mountain or a city. And so there's some kind of frustration there for those uh, diligent Bible students who would look into such things. And they'd say, well, wait a minute. We sort of get sidetracked here. And there's, a, there's a, another point of emphasis that's, that's shifted to, so we don't ever really see uh, the bride of Christ, and this is a mysterious uh, wording. The Bible doesn't say very much about it. Back up a little bit to Revelation chapter 19 for a moment. We'll see a couple of references to the marriage supper, the marriage of the Lamb, who, who is Jesus Christ, of course. 19.7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Verse 9 uh, verse 8 says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And some people conclude, because of what the Bible says is her raiment, she's clothed in in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, that the bride of Christ is all believers. Well, you know, this is the only reference that would lead one to believe that, and so we should reserve judgment on, you know, who is exactly the bride of Christ? And sadly, the Bible doesn't say very much about it, but go, but go back quickly to Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll, we'll see one, what I consider to be pretty specific reference, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And somebody pointed out recently that, that submitting is not really submitting if you already agree. That's just agreement. 
That's not submitting. And the Bible gives us a number of applications for submission to truth and submission to authorities. Hebrews 13, 7 speaks of submission to one's pastor. Uh, this speaks of a wife submitting to her husband. And if she agrees with him, that's not submission. She submits because, because she doesn't necessarily agree. Otherwise, it's just agreement. And if God calls us to submit, well, then that's very important. 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the body, and he is, a, he is a, excuse me, the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own, their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And the next few verses are about the Lord purifying his church. Verse, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But then in the next few verses, he talks about the husband and how he ought to treat his wife and favor her because he loves her more than his own body. Verse 29 says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth, cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Notice verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And, and it's interesting, the husband, wife, husband, wife, husband, wife, instruction that's given there and then the apostle paul wrote in verse in verse um 32 this is a great mystery but i speak concerning christ and his church and we get the impression the husband wife relationship is to be applied as well to christ and his church and so it remains to a to a good and faithful bible student to find out what a church is what is the church and there are plenty of people who imagine, who believe that the church is the same as all the saints. And it's universal and invisible. But if you study your New Testament, you study your Bible, you find out that the church is a specific local assembly. It's visible, it's, and that's what body means, soma. It's a word that implies that which has substantial existence and is able to cast a shadow. In other words, it's something that's real. What kind of body did Christ have when he was here? He had a local visible body. And ecclesia, that's translated church 114 times in the New Testament, is always a reference to a local assembly or else the church generically but not universally. It's not a universal reference. And, and so the question remains for us, is the church the same as the family of God and the kingdom of God? These are universal and visible, and all saved people are in the family of God, and all saved people are in, in Christ's spiritual kingdom here on the earth if they're living, if they're saved and they're alive physically. They're part of this invisible kingdom that's on the earth, but is that the same as the church? Well, that is something that we take serious exception to in Acts 2.41. We don't have the time to, to discuss this in detail and to go into a long discussion on what a church is. But in Acts 2.41, the Bible says, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and they were added the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Who was that? Who was the, Who were they added to? They were added to the church that was already existent in Jerusalem that had been praying in the upper room. Was this all saints? No, there were a whole lot of people who were saved but weren't part of Christ's church. And I think that's evident as you study through the New Testament. And so who is the bride? Well, Ephesians 5, I think, is, is, is a, about as specific as we can get when the Bible says this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church, that the husband-wife relationship is about Christ's church. And so what is a church? And that's the next main question. And, and you know, I think that the word of God would teach us that it's not about all the saints everywhere of all ages that are part of Christ's church 
or that are churches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says, so Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And that would imply that they were a body of Christ there at Corinth. They were a, they were a complete church. There at Corinth, it was a visible assembly and, and not a, a universal invisible body. And, and there are people who who have two churches. They believe in the local church, but they also believe in the universal invisible church. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, there's only one. There's only one body. There's only one kind of body, one kind of church. There's not two. One local and one universal invisible. And so, and so it, it, it remains for us to be good students, faithful students of the Word of God to find out what a church really is. And it seems not from Revelation, but from Ephesians chapter five. It seems that the 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 bride of Jesus Christ is His church, and so that takes us a long ways down another uh, direction, other than the course that's set for those who just imagine that that includes all saved people. Look at Matthew chapter twenty-two with me, and there is another reference to. The, the, to Christ getting married, though it's not any more specific as to identify who the bride is. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 3, the Bible says, He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready come unto the marriage. And there's a marriage that's alluded to in Christ's um, parable here and he stated the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son in verse 2 and so this is another parable of Christ and it goes down quite a ways down to verse 11 which says when the king came in to see the guests he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment and he saith unto him friend how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment and he was speechless and this was, and in, this is interestingly, a guest who was not properly adorned to be at the wedding. So there, were, there are guests at the wedding as well. Not just the bridegroom and the bride, but there are guests. And who are the guests at the marriage supper? If Christ's own local visible assembly, if his church is the bride, the guests would be other saved people, other saints. Of other, of other times, maybe of other situations that are not actually part of scriptural New Testament churches. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and I realize this is rather sketchy because the purpose of this lesson is not to discuss or study in detail what a church is, but in Luke 12, 36, the Bible says, and ye yourselves like like unto men that wait for their Lord when he returned from the wedding. Then when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. And so the wedding uh, theme is found many times in the scriptures. Look at chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, verse 8. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than, than thou be bidden of him. And this is about humility, obviously, and not about the marriage Supper of the Lamb. But look at chapter 25 of Matthew. Chapter 25 of Matthew. And here's one other reference to this. And the Bible says in verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, forgive us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. And the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were ready, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Did he marry all of those virgins? No, he didn't. The Bible identifies that a man should marry only one woman. And so these were, these were 
participants or perhaps guests at the wedding as well. Some have likened the, the lack of oil to the fact that the, the Holy Spirit was not truly indwelling these, these people who missed this marriage because they did not have oil. But, but the point is, the point is that Revelation 21 talks about, mentions the marriage of the lamb and the bride, the lambs, the, you know, the wife, the bride of, of Christ, but does not, does not, uh, you know, specifically give us details about who that is. And so we have to look to other scriptures to find answers. Who is the bride, the lamb's wife? And it's, it's something that I don't preach about very often just simply because there is so little that's stated about it in the Bible. And, and to be dogmatic about a few portions of Scripture, if somebody says to me, what do you believe about the bride of Christ? I'll be happy to tell them. Um, and, and am I absolutely dogmatic? You've got to believe this because this is what the Bible says. It's just implication. The Bible gives us implications about these things. And so we can form some conclusions based on what the Bible implies but it's not like salvation by grace through faith, which is directly stated that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's, it's, more, an, it's more a doctrine of implication. And, and so it's something that is not profitable to necessarily address uh, very often or very particularly because the Bible just doesn't say very much about it. It's kind of like, in one sense, the fact that the Bible never commands people, never never commands believers to speak in tongues. It's mentioned, and it's and the misuse of that gift is corrected in the New Testament, but never never does any church group receive a command or any group of believers receive a command that they ought to speak in known languages that they haven't previously studied that they need to pursue after this gift of the Spirit. And, and if the Bible doesn't say much about it, well then we are on, we're treading on thin ice if we say very much about it. We make it a platform or a mainstay for our doctrinal position. And so we don't do that but we don't neglect to study it if the Bible does mention it, even if it just seems like it's just a, a casual reference or a, mention, a reference in passing. Well, let's go back to our, our, to our Revelation 21 text, and we'll look a little further in this study. We need to move along here. Who is the bride, the lamb's wife? Well, we would say that we think we know it seems to be a visible, tangible assembly of believers, the, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, that, he cla that he'll claim as his bride. And will that be, will that be every member, every person that's been, that's been scripturally baptized? No, I would say that would be, since Christ wants a faithful bride, that would be faithful and participating church members in scriptural New Testament churches. And somebody might say, well, I never had a chance to join one. I never had a chance to be a part of one. Okay, well, you know, are you saved? That's the main thing. You'll be in heaven if you're saved, period. And you may end up being one of the guests at the weddings, at the marriage supper, instead of being part of the bride of Christ. Um, I honestly can only uh, surmise some of those things just because the Bible only implies some of these principles. But, you know, at least we know for sure about salvation by grace through faith, and that's a great blessing to know for sure that you're one of the redeemed, that your sins are forgiven if you are, and if they are, and that you're headed for heaven. It's a, it's a glorious, glorious future God has in store for his people. Well, let's read on in verse 11. We see letter B, the heavenly city, is glorious. And the Bible talks about uh, the, the glory of God. Her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper sun, clear as crystal. And once again, you know, the apostle John didn't know exactly what he was describing. He could only say it seems like this. It's sort of like this. But we gather some things through reading this portion of Scripture, which we won't read again. First of all, note the city 
will have walls and foundations and, the, and gates. And the gates stand for the 12 tribes and the foundations represent the 12 apostles in verses 12 to 14 teach us this truth and and I think about 12 apostles I don't think Judas is na- is numbered in that group I don't think his name's going to be preserved in the new creation cuz he was the son of perdition and and the apostle Paul calls himself you know the the apostles born out of due time and yet he was probably one of the most influential and prolific of all the New Testament apostles. Matthias, we never read his name again after Acts chapter 1, never see his name again in the New Testament, I don't think. So I, re- I believe that the 12 will be the 11 plus the apostle Paul. That's who I believe the 12 are going to be here. We call him the 13th apostle. But I believe that he will have some special honor and recognition in this heavenly city. It's a glorious place. The Bible tells us it'll be 12,000 furlongs cubed and the height and the width of it is the same as the, as the length of it. And that's about 1,500 miles. And, and imagine a, a city that's 1,500 miles two ways, but also, but also 1,500 miles high. And somebody was telling me that if you look at the continent of Africa, about halfway up the continent, it's about 1,500 miles across. And so it's a huge, huge area. If you have to drive 1,500 miles to where you're going on vacation, that's a long, long ways. And the heavenly city is going to be gigantic in that sense. And the Bible says the wall will be 144 cubits. cubits. I assume that's high. That's 200 feet high. Uh, The Bible tells us in verse 18 that the heavenly city will shine like a pure gemstone. Verse 18 says, And the building of the wall of it was was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like a clear crystal. And, And when is gold clear? We don't know gold as being anything but the yellow, shiny metal that we have on our rings and other jewelry. When is gold clear? Maybe if it's purified to it to the nth degree, it would turn clear. I don't know. And maybe the gold color that we see is still impurities that are, that are found in it. The Bible says that the streets are paved with clear, clear as crystal gold, but it's like under clear glass. A little bit later on, verse 21 says the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And, and maybe when gold is purified to the nth degree, it turns clear. I don't know. But I do know when the Bible says that the streets are paved with gold, uh, that implies that what we consider to be precious here is commonplace in God's economy. God uses, God uses gold for paving material <laughs> in heaven. And, and all, this, all the gemstones that are mentioned and all the precious things that are listed here in this portion of Scripture would lead us to the conclusion that the heavenly city is a glorious, glorious place to be. The foundations and the gates are all precious stones and pearls in verse 19 to 21 teach that he mentions the specific um, foundations and each one of them is of precious stone and a little bit earlier in the chapter we see each one will be engraved with the names of the 12 apostles and so and so this is a special thing and God will give some honor to certain people who have done who have done a an outstanding job following him and serving him with great dedication and zeal and and love and and I think it's notable in Hebrews chapter uh, I think it's chapter 6 verse 10 the Bible says God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love and and it's amazing to me after all he's done for us he still keeps track of what we do in return for his honor and glory. He still keeps track and he will reward those who serve him. 
uh, faithfully who honor the Lord, even though he's, he's done such a great thing in pouring out his great grace upon us. He's still, he's still faithful to remember and to commemorate and to reward those who honor him and serve him faithfully. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards as they're given out and how every man will be judged according to his works, not, not his sins, but his works. The sins are under the blood if you're a saved person, and they'll never be brought in accusation up against you again. What is it that makes the distinction? Oh, was it something really good that I did? No, I think, I think the distinction is, what was, what was your reason? What was your motivation? Was it because you love the Lord and you just want him to be honored in your life with your service? Or was it to gain the applause or the recognition of men? Which was it? Which is it? Why do you do what you do? Well, I think it could be safely said that these apostles and those who will be honored in the, in the new Jerusalem, in the recreation, are people who, who serve the Lord with the right spirit, with the right attitude. But we should notice, let us see, that Christ is the real glory of heaven. And verse 22 says, I saw no temple there in the Lord, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to bring their glory and honor into it. Christ is the real glory of heaven. The Bible says, first of all, there in verse 22, that Christ, the, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, are the temple. He is the source of worship. The Lord is the chief recipient of worship, and he's the one who ought to be honored. You know, people talk about the glorious, the beauties of, of the edifices that are put up in God's name in our world. And they use gold and they use all kinds of elaborate materials and there's a lot of stained glass that's very valuable to mark a place of worship. But the reality is the Lord should be the glory and not some expensive trapping, not some expensive decoration. The Lord is the one who ought to be honored. And he's the glory. He is the temple of heaven. He is the source of worship. He he ought to be its chief recipient. And nobody should say, look at what a glorious place of worship we have here. The apostles did that when they were showing Christ around Jerusalem. And they they tried to get him to, I'm sure they they wished that he was awed by the glories of Jerusalem of Herod's temple in in Matthew 24 1 they showed him all the temple and so on they showed him all the all the beautiful sights that were there and the magnificence and all the glory and all the expense that went into and Herod the great built that temple Uh, it was probably elaborate like kind of like Solomon's temple was that had been destroyed some centuries before but he was trying to appease the Jews he was trying to gain their favor and so he built them a very elaborate uh, temple and Jesus said there's not going there's coming a day there's not going to be any two stones left standing upon another this is going to be destroyed too and anything it's a good lesson for us because the fact is anything temporal (coughs) anything that's that you can see with your eyes that's got substance to it is going to fade away and is going to fail. It's going to be gone. Some people spend a whole lot of time, and I understand being a good steward and keeping paint on your house so that it doesn't rot and fall down around your ears. I I understand that. But some people spend a whole lot of time shining up their car, and that's it's as if that's their God. You know, they, they take care of that thing maybe their boat or their lake cottage or whatever it is, as though it were the number one article, the number one theme of their life. It's not. And we ought to take care of what God gives us, and we ought to be good stewards and invest ourselves. But to, to make that so, so elaborate and so decorative and so, and so central to our attention is not a scriptural 
thing for us to do because it's going to pass away. It's going to be gone. And only what's done for Christ will last. And so don't focus too hard on the things of this world, on the temporal, the things that will pass. Christ is the real glory of heaven. He is the temple and he's the light of that glorious place. You remember in John chapter 8 and 9, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He's the one and he challenges people in Matthew chapter 5 to let their light so shine before men that God that they would see their they would see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Once again, it's all pointed towards the Lord, and they ought not to see that you're a good person or you're doing good things and glorify you. They ought they ought to be directed to bring honor and glory to the Lord, because He's the one who accomplished that. He's the one who did that. He's the one who's worthy of our praise. But in that heavenly city, Jesus Christ will be the light. The Bible says that there's no need, in verse 23, verse 23 there's, there's no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Jesus Christ is not only the temple, he's also the light of that, of that glorious place. And the Bible tells us that he will be glorified and he's worthy of that glory. Notice quickly, letter D, heaven will be a secure, pure place. And verses 25 to 27 state, The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abominations or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And, and it'll be a secure and pure place. A lot of people these days live in gated communities because they want to control who comes in because they want to keep that, that uh, crime-inclined element, the burglary, robbery-inclined element out if they can. And so they have a gated community or they have a secure neighborhood. They have, you've got to punch in a coat or you've got to swipe your your access card or whatever it is before you can actually get in because there's less and less security in our world but but heaven will be a safe and secure place and the bible says the gates will be open all the time and there's no night there and there's no sin there and there's no wickedness there and there's nothing there that will defile on any level and that's a powerful statement in itself and ought to raise the question, oh, I think I'm going to heaven. Okay, well, what are you going to do about your sin? And what about your sin? You can't take it to heaven with you because no sin will be allowed in heaven. And have you properly, have you biblically dealt with your sin issue? Have you acknowledged and admitted your sin and, and sought forgiveness and repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ so that you might be forgiven. Because you're not going to be able to take any of your sin to heaven with you. There's not any sin there. It's a pure place. It's a secure place. It's a safe place. And there is no closing or locking of doors. I remember reading some time ago that somebody was puzzled when they visited they visited the farm out west somewhere because they come from the big city. They noticed the door; none of the doors had locks on them. There was a day when you didn't have to lock your doors in our country. It, people were safe and secure without having to shut out or lock the doors or keep, try to keep out intruders. And sadly, that day seems like it's gone forever in our, in our nation but there won't be any door locks. In fact, they won't even close the doors in heaven because it'll be a secure and safe place. There'll be no darkness or night because Jesus Christ is the light, and there'll be no sin there. Only saved people will be in heaven, and God will see to it that nothing enters in that's not cleansed, that's not purified, that's not covered, that's not forgiven under the blood of Christ, and the sin removed. And that's one of the conditions that's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about people inheriting the kingdom of God. We've got to, we've got to, to, to shrug off our old fleshly nature, our old sin nature, before we, can, before we can go home and be with Christ.
because, because if the sin nature enters in there, then there will still be sin. There will still be sin. Isn't that grievous? Don't you wish you could be forever freed from your sin nature? If you know Christ, you grieve over that. One preacher said, one of the main differences between a saved person and a lost person, and I've said this recently, is a saved person runs away from sin. A lost person runs to sin. And, and we still have the, old same, the same old sin nature, even though we may be saved, but it doesn't have the appeal for us. We hate it, whereas we used to love it. And won't it be a glorious day when it's gone forever? And Jesus would say, and the scriptures teach here, that there won't be anything that gets into heaven that will defile or that work of, or the work of abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we examined the Lamb's book of life just a couple weeks ago. Those whose names are written in it have life, and those whose names are not written in the, in the book of life do not have eternal life. The Lamb's book of life. And it's mentioned at the end of Revelation chapter 20 at the, with the great white throne judgment. We've just considered it, like I said, recently because of that. But heaven is indeed a glorious place and, and the recreation will be effective and it will fulfill God's purpose and he will be honored and glorified as a result for all eternity. Amen. Make sure, make sure that you're going there. Make sure that you know for sure that your sins are forgiven. The Bible says this is something that we can know for sure, and we ought to. We ought to know it. We ought to know it for sure. And if, if, if somebody just says, well, I hope I'm saved. I hope I'm going to heaven. You know, the Bible says you can know, and you need to know that. So make sure that you've, submitted yourself to the Lord and that you can say I know for sure that heaven is my home what a great thing to know for sure that you're saved that your sins are forgiven you know what we're all we're all terminal you say that would be so shocking for the doctor to say I'm sorry you're terminal we're all terminal we're all going to die one day and so it remains to us to make sure that we're ready to face death and face eternity when that comes, when this, when this brief stay here on this earth is over, when our brief mortal life comes to an end. Are you ready for eternity? It would, be ho it would behoove each of us to make sure that we know that for sure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help us. Thank you for the pictures that you give us for the descriptions that you give us in your word about the glories of heaven father that new creation that heavenly city and i pray that we would be people who would take that very seriously and would make sure that we are sure that we're going there thank you that we can know this and we don't have to just wait and see and hope for the best but rather we can know for sure that our sins are forgiven and that Jesus Christ is our Savior and that heaven is our home. Thank you for these great precious promises. Thank you for what you do tell us about heaven and the eternal state. And may we anxiously look forward to that day when you call your people to be with you forever. Bless this service and I pray for those who may not know for sure that they're saved. They'll seek the Lord while they have opportunity in the next opportunity they have to turn to Christ. Bless the service that follows. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, you're dismissed for about 15 minutes until 11 o'clock, and we'll begin the 11 o'clock service. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. It's great to see you here today. Let's stand together and take our hymnals. Turn over to number 545. Everyone stand as we sing, Christ receiveth sinful men. Sing out on the first verse. Sinners, Jesus will receive. Father, we thank you that you do receive sinners, that you make it possible for us to be forgiven, cleansed of our sins, and welcomed into your presence, into your glorious family. Father, we thank you that we don't have to do it ourselves. We would be unable to perform at that level. And Father, the Bible says all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and some people imagine that they're good, but the Bible says there is no good thing person in this world father we need a righteousness that we can't ourselves produce and we rejoice in your love your mercy and your grace that you've extended salvation forgiveness and divine righteousness to us and father you clothe the forgiven sinner with your righteousness so that what you see is the righteousness of christ on us and father we just rejoice in that great promise that great provision that you've made for us who believe. I pray that you'll work in hearts today and help people to see that they cannot please God themselves. And Father, we need the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray that you'd glorify the Lord in our response to truth today. Bless the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So good to see you here. We're glad to have you at Bible Baptist Church. And if you're our guest, I'm Pastor Mike Custer, the pastor of the church. We do this on Sunday mornings every week at 11. We have a 945 service that we've just finished, Sunday school hour in the adult Bible class, and then Sunday evenings at 6, Wednesday evenings at 7, when we have our regular church services. And you're invited to attend anytime that you can. Our own folks are very faithful, and we appreciate being able to serve with them here. And it's a joy to to know Christ and know that everything's all right. We live in a dangerous world, don't we? And there are lots of things that could cause us to be fearful and afraid. Some people uh, glory in the fact that they say there's no fear. They have no fear at the same time. And sometimes they emblazon that on on their apparel even. But 
the reality is, you know, the fear of death is something that has plagued the human family through the ages. And what a blessing it is to know that everything's all right. And if the very worst should happen, you know what I'm talking about. If somebody should die, at least it's possible for us to know that we're going to be in heaven with the Lord. And this brief time that we spend on this, in this temporal plane, it's just a short while, it's just a little while, will we'll open up into eternity with Christ if you know Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. And that makes all the difference in the world. If we can help you, please let us know, and that is our main focus. We want to reach people for Christ, and we want to help them to grow in the Lord and become fruitful servants of Christ after they've been saved by the grace of God. Remember the regular service tonight at 6 p.m., and I want to say this. Uh, we have a young man who's, who's serving in the military here, and he's going to today's his last service before he's or his last day before he's deployed for over a year and Andrew Dawes we're going to miss you and your bride will miss you and your family as well but we're so glad that he can be here today at least before he leaves for his military duty and pray for him while he's gone and we'll expect and trust the Lord to bring him back to us safely amen all right, as you come, please, and we'll receive the morning offering, and we'll have some more singing and, pre and, and music before the preaching time today. Brother Paul Sikoski, would you pray, please?
Amen. Let's stand together and take our hymnals once again. Let's turn over to number 595. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Hymn number 595. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path away, to guide and to save me from sin. Continue on number 814. Wonderful grace of Jesus, number 814. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise be? Jesus. 
arms of grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus. singing. Thank you. You may be seated. It's a great message, 
And those who truly know the Lord Jesus Christ are concerned about pleasing the Lord. And people who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior don't care about such things. They don't care about pleasing the Lord. They want to please themselves. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that man in his natural sinful condition is not seeking God. He's looking for a good time. He's looking for a party. And whereas when a person comes to know Christ as Savior, they become concerned about eternal and spiritual issues. And they, they desire to walk worthy of the Lord. Great, great message in that, in that song today. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's pray and we'll begin today. Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit would lead us and convict hearts. And Father, accomplish your great work in lives through this message. Through the portion of scripture that we'll be focusing on today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A lot of people in America die every year. Not because they didn't have access to proper medical treatment but because they didn't know they were sick and maybe it was it was too late by the time they finally found out they were sick their condition had advanced to the point where where it it couldn't properly be treated or reversed just because they didn't realize that they're sick that they were sick that they had a disease not that it was untreatable but they just weren't aware that they were sick and and people do get checkups these days and they go for regular examinations because they want to know. They want to know if something is lurking unseen. Some people are hypochondriacs, as we, as we term them. They, think, they always think they're sick. And they imagine all kinds of things are happening in their body that are not happening at all. And I guess that fearfulness is probably endemic to the, net, to the human condition where where if you get some kind of an ache or a pain that persists, you imagine, oh, I'm, I, I wonder if I've got a tumor. I wonder if I've got cancer growing in my body or something uh, serious like that, and then it clears up and then we forget about it. But the fact of the matter is most people, normal thinking people, don't go to the doctor unless they're pretty sure or know for sure that they're sick. And there are a number of reasons for that. Some people just don't like to go to the doctor. They don't like hospitals. They don't like waiting rooms. They don't like physicians' attention. And so they'll stay away if they can. Other people realize this is very time-consuming and expensive. And so we're not going to spend the time and invest ourselves in this direction unless we know for sure that something is going on there. And that's, I think, a sensible approach as well. But it, it also has a spiritual application. I'd like for you to open your Bible to Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. And of course, the Gospel of Mark is one of the f first four books of the New Testament, all called Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're about the life of Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ's teachings. And then after that come come the, the Pauline epistles, the book of Acts, of course, then the Pauline epistles and a few other epistles, letters of instruction, doctrinal uh, uh, principles that are, that are communicated in the New Testament. But the first four are about the life of Christ. And we see this in Mark chapter 1. We're going to read verse 35 to 45 for our text in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. The Bible here says, And in the morning, rising up, a great while before day he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed and this is interesting that Christ who is who is God in the flesh yet spent a lot of time in prayer and he understood the idea of submitting to his father and there is a natural chain of command as it were even though Christ is not inferior God the Son is not inferior to God the Father. He did subordinate himself to God the Father as the Son. And that is and was appropriate. And so he spent a lot of time in prayer. Verse 36 says, And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. 
And he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues, or all Galilee, and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed, and he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See thou, say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Now this in itself indicates the reason why Jesus said a lot of times during his personal earthly ministry when he healed somebody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. It wasn't because he was trying to keep it a secret, but he just didn't want the cities. Uh, so packed with people that he wouldn't be able to go into the towns and villages and the cities and and preach and this happened he told this man whom he'd cured of his leprosy don't tell anybody but he did anyway and the result was that that um, he could no more openly verse 45 just says Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without in desert places and they came to him from every quarter he drew such a crowd that he wanted to try to contain those crowds for a while. You recall the example of the four men who brought their friend to Christ. I think that was in Capernaum. And they, they took him up on top of the house and they broke up the roof and the, the tiles of the roof and removed some of the tiles from the roof so it was open so they could let him down because they couldn't get into the house otherwise. It was so packed with people who came, to be, who came to see Jesus, who came to be healed by the Lord Jesus Christ and his friends wanted to get him there and so they had to resort to some extreme measures to do that. There are a number of things that I want us to see in this portion of scripture. The first, and we'll talk about... Uh, whether a person is sick or whole, and that's the title of the message, Sick or Whole. We'll get to some other verses of Scripture that deal with uh, this particular issue. First of all, I want us to see those who are drawn to the Lord. In verses 35 to 39, the Bible says that people, and, and indicates us to us through the Scriptures, that people seek Christ for many reasons. They, they want, they're interested in Christianity, in Jesus, for a lot of different kinds of reasons. And just as they did in this first century Israel during the Lord's personal earthly ministry, some had physical needs. And if you'll turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 5, we read... When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And verse 6 says, This he said to prove him, for himself, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus, of course, multiplied that food. He fed 5,000 people who, who were just men only in that feeding miracle with five loaves and two fishes, and he made that lunch grow. And after the feeding miracle, the Bible tells us the people wanted him to be their king. They wanted to make him king. And I'm sure they were thinking, wow, we won't have to work anymore if, if this person can go ahead and feed us like that. He can multiply just a little bit of food and give us all we need. Free food, and I wonder if they were thinking free housing, a monthly government check. Definitely, definitely they were being disingenuous in their reason for seeking after the Lord. But there are lots of reasons why people are looking for Christ sometimes they imagine that he'll fix my life so that I won't have some of the same irritations and issues to deal with that I have and while the Lord does definitely forgive sin and bring salvation to a human life you know what this world is full of trouble there's always going to be trouble in this in this world in this life 
And so that won't cure all your issues. It will resolve the compelling issue of eternity when you come to Jesus Christ. But a lot of people want more than that. They want God like the people were doing here in John chapter 6. They were wanting him to feed them all the time. But Christ did not come for that reason. And so he avoided such situations. Some people came to him because they had diseases that needed to be healed. And a lot of people came to Christ to be healed but it became evident that the spiritual side was a different matter they didn't necessarily want salvation they just wanted release from their physical infirmities and if he could deal with this if he could manage this that's all well and good but I don't want Christ it kind of reminds me of the individual I talked to some years ago who said he wanted to be saved and when I began to challenge him about his ungodly lifestyle, he said, whoa, he said, does that mean I need to give up my sin? I have to be well. I said, you've got, you got to be willing to give up your sin. He said, well, I don't want to get saved then. And he didn't. And he went away. And I never saw him again because that's not what he was wanting. He wanted some kind of a panacea. He wanted some kind of a cure-all some kind of magic pill that would that would resolve the problems or the fears of his life but didn't want God to change him and let me tell you something friend God doesn't come into somebody's life unless he can change that person and if we put those kind of parameters on God and say oh, I don't want to repent I don't want God to take over my life you can't have him as your Lord and your Savior and your master if you aren't willing for him to take over your life and that would explain a lot of things about a lot of people. That's why you're not saved today, perhaps, is because you don't want Jesus to be your Lord and your master. You don't want him to come into your life and change you and make you a new person and give you a new set of desires. This is what real Bible salvation is all about. It's not, it's not about just a fire escape. The Bible doesn't give us a, a free ticket Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. There's still a burden to bear. There's a yoke to, to wear as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, you can't, be, you can't be my disciple unless you're willing to forsake yourself and everything else and follow me. You can't be my disciple. And so there are some conditions placed on salvation in that regard not that we earn salvation it's a gift of God it's by grace it's a free gift but the, but it will cost you something if you if you intend to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and some people all they want is the benefits and so they come to the Lord with physical needs they come because they want their diseases healed look at Mark chapter 1 verse 39 here in Mark 1 39 the Bible says, and he preached in all their synagogues or all Galilee and cast out devils. Yes, Jesus definitely was uh, benefiting people and healing the sick and so on. But his main purpose, listen to Matthew 9.35. He went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And so he definitely loves people and is compassionate toward people. But the fact of the matter is he came for more than just that. Why, why were there only 12 apostles? Why did Christ spend his three and a half year ministry instructing 12 men? Those were the ones who had said, we're going to follow you wherever you go. We're going to give our lives. We're going to lay down our lives if necessary to be servants, to be to be ministers of the gospel and to serve God and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. There were only 12. Why were there only 120 in his first church in Jerusalem? Even after his resurrection, Acts 1.15 teaches us there were 120. Well, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, many came to Christ only for what they could get. Things that would be to their physical or, benef or financial benefit. And a good, a good illustration of this is seen in Luke chapter 17 when 10 lepers came to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 17, verse 12 and following, the Bible says, as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself unto the priests. 
And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And they would, they would have to be examined by somebody in the priesthood in the Jewish tradition in order to be cleared so they could go back to their home. Otherwise, they had to live separate. And, and you know the term leper colonies, places where people were sort of kept and they, and they were required to stay there because they, were, they had leprosy and they could not live in a normal uh, community with their families and so on because they were afflicted with this terrible disease and and that was one reason why these people wanted to be healed or cleansed and Jesus said go show yourself unto the priests and they went and if you read the rest of that portion of scripture from verse 15 and following only one only one turned back and said thank you Lord for healing me what was on the minds of all the others? Oh, wow, we can go back to our families now. We can go back to life as normal. This is wonderful what this person has done for us. They had no, they had no feelings of love or dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't even come back to thank him for what he had done for them. They were only, probably only in it for what they could get for themselves. Even today, many people are drawn to Christianity because they have pressing emotional, financial, or even spiritual needs. And they're going to try Jesus. I heard someone say just recently, somebody said, oh yeah, I'll give that a try. I'll try Jesus. I've tried everything else. May I say this to you? Jesus Christ will not profit you unless, unless he is your only solution, unless you see him as the only answer. It's not a matter of, well, I've tried this and this and this and that, and that didn't work, and so now I'll try Jesus. That's not going to work either because faith is, is an essential element. You have to be thinking. You have to be believing. He is the answer, not just another possible answer that I'll try. You have to be thinking he is the answer. You have to realize that, that faith in Jesus Christ is paramount and the most important and critical issue in the discussion or else he will benefit you nothing because without faith you cannot please God. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith it's impossible to please him. We won't receive anything from the Lord unless we come to him with a proper heart attitude and some people may even bargain with God. Oh God, if you'll just do this and this and this and that for me, then I'll, I'll believe on you, I'll serve you, I'll follow you. And then one could imagine, well, I've earned this. I've, just, I've gotten these benefits because, because of what I, the bargain that I, that I made with God. God doesn't bargain with people. He says, you come to me, period. You come to me without reserve. You come to me unconditionally, and then we'll see how things work out. He's promised he'll forgive sins. He's promised he'll make somebody his child who comes to him that way. He doesn't promise they're going to be whole or well or they're going to have a long life. He doesn't promise any of those other things, but he does promise to forgive and to save. But we have to turn to the Lord without reservation. Have you ever done that? Have you ever turned to the Lord and said, it doesn't matter. That's what repentance is, by the way. Repentance is without reservation. Not just believing facts in your head, but receiving Jesus Christ in your heart. I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I'm condemned. I need salvation. And Jesus Christ is the only one. Lord, save me. I believe those truths. And I come to you without reservation. And if you've never come to the Lord that way, friend, no matter what you say you believe, you're not saved. You're not saved. Because salvation is doesn't come in the head salvation comes to the heart and if you believe all those things in your head that's good that may be a good start but the difference between heaven and hell may only be 18 inches or so from the head to the heart the bible says with the heart man believeth unto righteousness with the heart with the entire being, with soul, with, without reserve, no reservations. I'm putting myself, I'm throwing myself on God's mercy. I'm putting myself in Christ's hands. I have no hope otherwise. I have no choice. And Jesus Christ is the only wise choice. The fact of the matter is, God doesn't need you 
or me. You may be the most intelligent person in this state or in this nation or in this world. You may be the, the highest wage earner that anybody can imagine. But you know what? God doesn't need you. And God doesn't need me. He reaches down to us in his mercy and love and grace. And says, you need me. I don't need you. You need me. And that's why God sent his son. The Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's not believing facts in the head. That's believing in the heart with commitment, with a repentant attitude. Oh, how we need him. The Bible teaches us that we must come to God his way on his terms or not at all. I remember years ago, a good friend, some of you remember evangelist Al Lacey, who used to come and preach at our church every year for a number of years, many, many, dec several decades ago. But he used to preach a message titled Burger King Religion. How many of you remember that message? Okay, quite a few of you do. And back then, Burger King's advertising campaign was, have it your way. And he said a lot of people imagine that God will accept Burger King religion. Just do it your way. Have it your way. And God will accept that. No, it's got to be God's way. You, it doesn't matter what your way is. You've got to repent of your way and say, I'm done with that. I don't want that anymore. I need to come to the Lord his way. And that was the thrust of that message. And he got into some very great detail as to exactly how that would happen. But listen, salvation is not based on performance. Our performance, your performance, or mine. Salvation is not based on performance. And just because I may decide I need to perform in a certain way, that doesn't mean I'm saved. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Here's a powerful passage of Scripture. Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 7. He's addressing this issue of, of some people's confidence in performance-based religion. In Matthew 7, 21, he said, Not everyone, that, and this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount, but Jesus said in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. In John 6, 40, he says, The will of my Father is that everyone would believe on me. That's the will of, God's, of, of, Christ, of, of God the Father. Verse 22, he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And this is a powerful example. And a lot of people, Jesus said in that day, he's talking about the day of judgment. A lot of people are going to say to the Lord, Lord, we did this, we did this, we cast out devils, we did all these wonderful works in your name, but I will profess unto them, I never have known you. Salvation is not performance-based. But what about somebody who says they believe in Jesus and they've done all these wonderful things? Okay, have they been saved by the grace of God? Have they repented of their sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? And if not, friend, you're still lost. It, salvation is not performance-based. And he will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, you worker of you that work iniquity. Because they have tried to do it their way, but it's not the same. They don't go to the great physician as sin-sick souls because they don't see it. Look at Mark chapter 2 with me. Mark chapter 2. Verse 17, we talked a little earlier about people who don't go to the doctor because they don't think they're sick. In Mark 2, 17, the Bible says, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the, of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If some, in other words, if somebody thinks they're righteous, they won't go to the Lord. I'm okay, I'm okay. I don't need that salvation stuff. I don't need to be born again. I'm fine. 
They won't come to the Lord unless they understand that they have a need. Just like somebody won't go to the doctor unless they understand, unless they realize that they're sick. Who goes to the doctor? What are your complaints? The doctor says, what's going on? Oh, nothing. I feel fine. Then why are you here? Why are you even here if you don't, if you imagine you're, you're okay and you don't have any complaints and you don't have any health issues? Why are you here? It's a reasonable question. People don't go to the doctor unless they see themselves as being sick. And Jesus himself said that, you won't come to me unless you realize you've got a need. And that's why I preach regularly, before you can get saved, you've got to get lost. You've got to realize that you're lost in your sins and you're under divine wrath before you can ever get saved because you won't come to the Lord unless, unless, for salvation unless you realize you're lost to begin with. That's not even reasonable. And it certainly is not scriptural. I see that there are people who are desperate for the Lord and this is a, a marked contrast between people who merely come to Christ and a man like this leper. Let's go back and read this again in Mark chapter 1. This man came to the Lord and he had something definite in mind because he knew how desperate was his need. The Bible says there in verse 30, in verse 40, there came a leper to him beseeching him and kneeling down to him saying unto him, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And we, we read about the same man in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and in Luke chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. It's notable this event is recorded in three Gospels. Why is it in all three? Why is it in three Gospels? Some things that you read in the Gospels are only found there one time. Why is this repeated three times in Matthew and Mark and Luke? I believe in the mind of God it's something that bears repeating, and there are some some strong principles here that need to be understood first of all there's an awareness of one's need there's an awareness of the need in verse 40 in the first part of verse 40 the bible says there came a leper to him beseeching him he besought him this word means to exhort or implore he was asking diligently and urgently he knew his need was a desperate need and that's what drove him to christ what is it that brings true repentance? When a person realizes, I've, I've got a desperate need here. And people who are casual about that, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I'd like to add Jesus to my life. There's no desperation there. And in most cases, without desperation, there's no true repentance. This man besought the Lord. He, he, he had a deep need. He was exhorting, he was imploring, he was asking diligently and urgently. And desperation says, I'm hopeless and helpless. I need salvation and forgiveness that only Jesus Christ can give. And it doesn't matter what it costs me. This was this man's attitude. He was, he was fully aware of his own need. I am a condemned sinner. I am diseased. I'm going to die. I need help. He was in a state of desperation. And that was the thing that moved him to repentance. I see an awareness of Christ's person in, in the next few words in verse 40. The Bible says he knelt down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He bowed down before the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew chapter 8, verse 2, the Bible says he worshipped him. Who ought to be worshipped? Only the Lord. This leprous man knew this was God in the flesh. He knew who he was. And he understood he had a desperate need and he honored the Lord Jesus Christ as God. And there is an awareness of Christ's power and sovereignty. He said, you can heal me if you will. I know you can make me clean. I know you can take away my disease if you will. And I think there are a couple things that should be noted here this man was sure of God's power he said he said thou canst can God do what what we need for him to do for us yes he can he is perfectly capable of doing exactly what is needed and look at 
quickly back to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, in the scriptures we read that God can do what needs to be done. Psalm 78, verse 17 says, And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God but trust, and trusted not in his salvation. Can God do this? Can God do that? And the Bible says that God was angered because they, they didn't believe that he could. A person who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ needs to believe that he can. He can do everything that he has said he would do. And, and there was an awareness in this man of Christ's power and sovereignty. He was aware of the Lord's power and he was aware of the Lord's prerogative, if thou wilt. You know what he's saying there? I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything good from God. If you will, if you're willing to, you can make me clean. But I don't deserve this. I don't deserve forgiveness. I don't deserve to be healed of my leprosy. I don't deserve your grace, your love, your mercy. And you know, we have, we are such, we are, we are so absorbed in our entitlement age. People imagine they deserve something. Oh, I deserve food and lodging. I deserve, and it's a human right. Healthcare is a human right. Where do we ever get that idea? I deserve to have my college debt forgiven. I deserve this. I deserve this. I deserve that. This entitlement age, I deserve to have the government pay my way. You know, we don't, in reality, in the spiritual realm especially, we don't deserve anything good from God. What we deserve is hell and torment and fire and judgment and wrath. That's what we deserve because we're sinners by nature and we're sinners on purpose. We use God's name in vain casually. We violate his commands carelessly. We break his commandments ceaselessly. We don't deserve anything good from God. And that's what makes it all the more glorious when somebody says, God, if you will, I know you can do this if you will it's not what I deserve God help me if I get what I deserve God help all of us if we got what we deserve but God because of his grace love and mercy allows us to have a place in his family and his kingdom He's reserved a place in heaven for those who are saved by his grace. In fact, the judgment is what we deserve. The wages that we should receive for what we've already done. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. But the gift of God, whoever, whoever deserved the gifts that people give you. And somebody smugly sits beside the Christmas tree. And when somebody brings them gift, oh, thanks, but I deserve that. No, it's, an, it's a nicety. It's a favor. If it's a gift, we understand. We don't deserve it. Somebody just wants to give us something because they love us. We don't deserve that. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, the, and we're not entitled to that. It's only his love and mercy that allow us to avert the wrath and the judgment that's coming. Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed unto men once to die. It's appointed to you to die. Yeah, it is. It's appointed to you, to you and me to die. But after this is the judgment. And how will you do? After you die, when you stand before God in judgment, how, how will you do? 
Well, if you're saved, you'll never have to stand before him as your judge because your sins are, are all forgiven. They're washed away in the blood of Christ. Do you know for sure that's where you, that's where you are? Do you know for sure that's where you stand? In the case of salvation, we know that he will. This leprous man was desperate and he was aware of Christ's person. He was aware of Christ's power. He was aware of his own need. And he was confident the Lord would do that if he, want, if he would. He could, he could heal him if he would. And the Bible says that God has promised to save everybody that comes to him in faith and repentance. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Are you saved? Do you know for sure that you're saved? Have you repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? It's the heart attitude that's all important. And not those who are merely drawn, but those who are desperate for salvation. Those who are willing to humble themselves and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they see the hopelessness of their lost condition. The question is, have you been saved? Have you repented and believed on? Have you called upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation today? Have you done that sometime in the past so that you know for sure today that you're saved? And if you don't, friend, you need to. You need to be saved by the grace of God. If you don't know Christ, you could. You could, you can. He is a gracious and the Bible says that he's still offering that invitation for people to be saved even today. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? When were you lost and when did you get saved? When did you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Seeking him, seeking him alone as the answer to your need. Have you been saved by God's grace? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us and Father, we see so many examples of this in the Bible. We could go through the scriptures for the next two or more hours just looking at verses of scripture that deal with the subject of salvation and that salvation is something that you intentionally bring to hearts because they intentionally come to you and they seek Christ and they seek the Lord and they're willing to submit to the Lord. They're willing to yield to Christ. Father, I pray that you'll help people today to realize how much they need the Lord. And yes, it will be a transformational choice in their life. But I've never known anybody who ever got saved who regretted it, who wished they hadn't. They only say, oh, if I'd only been saved sooner. If I'd only come to Christ earlier in my life before I had a chance to mess up a bunch of stuff if I'd only give the, given the Lord my life earlier but never any regrets oh I wish I hadn't got saved I wish I hadn't followed Jesus Christ and Father thank you for a new life in Christ and for assurance and peace in the heart that can't come from anywhere else there are a lot of people who try to convince themselves that they're okay. But Father, there's no peace in that. And in a pinch, some people, some people will even avoid going to funerals and will avoid any conversations that deal with life and death and the hereafter because, because it frightens them. They don't have any assurance. They don't have any peace in their heart about where they'll spend eternity. But Father, with the child of God, there's no fear. And there's peace and joy knowing that everything's all right. And Father, thank you for giving us that assurance even though the history of the world has been plagued by the fear of death and it becomes a sort of bondage there's no reason for the child of God to experience that father we're free in Christ and what a blessing that is I pray that you'll draw people to the Lord 
even today and accomplish your purpose in hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand to our feet, please, with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And no one looking around, if God's spoken to your heart today and you need to be saved by the grace of God, would you come? We want to take a Bible and show you how you could know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. And know for sure that heaven is your home and know for sure that your sins are forgiven and they're washed clean in the blood of Christ. We're not talking about semantics here. We're talking about realities. And the greatest reality of life is this eternal, even invisible thing. It's the greatest reality of life. You can't see it with your eyes. But God is very real, and his truth is compelling. And when the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and calls you to salvation, you ought to respond. You ought to say, okay, Lord, I'm willing. That's a great that's a great thing. My wife and I sometimes will sit out on the, on the back porch and just look at the stars at night. The awesomeness of the creative hand of God is amazing. The God who hung those stars in place, the God who created our universe. Wants to call you his child wants to have a real relationship with you personally. Isn't that amazing? And those who know and love Christ say, yes, he's very real. He's very real. As the Spirit of God works in your life tonight, today, would you come? We want to be a help and a blessing to you. How many would lift your hand and say, please pray for me. I'm concerned about my soul's salvation. And I'd appreciate your prayers. Thank you, young man. I saw your hand. Who else? Anybody else here like that? I'd, I'm concerned. Please pray for me. Thank you. A couple of young people. I see your hands. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm concerned about my eternal condition before a holy God. Would you pray for me? Father, you know every heart and every hand, and I pray that you'll work in these lives and make yourself real to them. Father, I pray that they would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior very soon. And there may be somebody here that did not lift their hand, but they have that same desire, and I pray for them as well. Father, would you just be able to reach down with your grace, your love, your mercy, and save that soul because we're willing to turn to the Lord with all of our being, with all of our heart. Well, wait just a moment. If God's spoken to your heart today, you come. Let the Lord have his way in your life. It's a great thing to be able to say, I know, I know for sure. Not, I hope so. Well, I hope everything's okay. I hope I'm going to heaven. I asked a man years ago who'd been, by his own profession, had been a member of a particular mainstream denomination all of his life, but he didn't know where he was going to go when he died. And I said, sir, are you satisfied with that? And he said, yes. And I went away grieved. I thought, how could somebody be satisfied not knowing when the Bible says you can know for sure? What a grievous thing to be content with a, I hope so when you could have and I know so and your very eternal soul is at risk. Will you turn to Jesus Christ today?
I thank you for your attention today. If we can help you one-on-one, -on -one, please don't hesitate to ask. We would, we would take joy in being able to be a blessing to you on some level. Thank you for being here today. Remember the 6 o'clock service this evening and trust that the Lord will teach us and challenge us and speak to our hearts again in the evening service. Amen. Brother Andrew Dawes, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?